Hello and welcome. My name is Chris from GamesIndustry.biz and I'm really excited to be hosting this session with one of the biggest video games companies in the UK. For much of its life, Team 17 has been best known for its Worms franchise, but in recent times it's become one of the biggest indie games publishers in the world, handling major games like Overcooked, The Escapists, Moving Out, Yoku's Island Express, Yokulele, Blasphemous, Golf With Your Friends and a whole load more. This year marks 30 years of Team 17, and to talk about that, the past, the future, the state of indie games, we have a real leader in the games industry with us, the CEO of Team 17, Debbie Beswick. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Chris. Wonderful build-up as ever. Thank you. <laughs> I was Every time there's add more and more games I have to add into that. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. How, how have things been for you, uh, particularly during this whole lockdown situation? Uh, I've been in lockdown for six months, right, with an 11-year-old. Um mm. And, you know, I think his first day is back at school today. Um, so I'm quite happy. I think for once in my life, I'm still wearing my noise cancelling headphones because I've become so used that I needed them. Um, but honestly, it's been absolutely fine. I think for a lot of people in the games industry, you know, we're kind of introverts to a certain degree anyway. And, you know, if anything, would I have gone out on a weekend? Probably not anyway, to be honest. Oh, that's all right. How, how about the team? Is, is it Has everyone adapted to working from home all right? Yeah, I mean, we move really, really fast um, at Team 17. You know, we have plans in place. Um, we've been following this in January and February. Um, not only did we move our own offices, we've got three offices here in the UK. Everybody moved to homework literally within about a week and a half. Um, but all of our studio partners around the world as well, we had great plans in place. Massive credit to the team that put this all together. Um, I was actually on a roadshow in beginning of March and from a hotel I made a phone call back to one of my heads in the studio and just said look can we get everybody on homework in I know we were planning half in half out and I went just get everybody homework in as fast as possible and so that was great I thought the platform holders were outstanding people like Sony Microsoft Nintendo it's not it's great for people who work in offices where you just lift a laptop up and take it home but think about development you know next generation consoles games testing kits all of that they worked really well with us throughout February to make sure we had plans in place um, we've launched a bunch of games during lockdown all on time our next generation games have been in development obviously throughout all that time as well and we're tracking really well so I'm immensely proud of how the whole team came together um, to get everything moving so swiftly you know whatever you think as a business number one is always your people always 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 the best safety that you can for your people so very delighted at the way that we responded brilliant well we're here to talk about Team 17, 30 years, um, which is frankly elderly in video games terms. Um, but I, I seem to remember you've told me this before, but it has a sort of unusual origin of a few things coming together. Why don't you tell us that story? How did it come to be? Sure. Thanks for the elderly comment. Can I just say we're not that old? <laughs> <laughs> we were teenagers when we started in um when we started Team 17. So um Team 17, correctly so, we came from a different set of backgrounds um three co-founders um myself um a guy called martin brown and what i would call the money man uh, a guy called michael robinson who also was an incredible as an entrepreneur in terms of looking ahead and seeing the way that the world was moving um I was over in the retail world. You know, we had a chain of stores across the UK. I think at the time it was one of the biggest independent retail chains. You know, I'm very proud of that indie retailer of the year that I won when I was 17. You know, that's really important. Um, we also owned another company called 17-Bit Software, you know, um, which was basically shareware software for the 16-bit Amiga market. Um, within that group, we obviously had access to development talent all across Europe and over in America as well, um, where they made the most incredible demos. And we sold those through a, our company called 17-Bit Software. 17-Bit was basically named because they were one bit better than the rest from the 16-Bit. So that's where the 17-Bit name came from. <laughs> Um, and basically, Michael Robinson um, was the guy, he, he, you know, he owned the retail chain, he owned 17-bet, he approached Martin, he approached myself and said, look, why, you know, we're selling video games through all, uh, all of our stores, we have access to the talent through 17-bet, 
why don't we actually start making video games? And there was a core group of guys, you know, people like Andreas Tadic, Rico Holmes back in those days, and they'd been working on a game for Codemasters, um, Miami Chase at that time. And it was like, look, we can make, basically, his vision really was, we kind of have our own app store. And this is back in late 80s, if you think about this, because we have the retail outlets. And video games weren't hugely expensive to make at that time. So we saw it that our break-even points we would meet anyway through our own retail chain oh, wow. on our games. Um, and so his idea was, let's build a games publishing group. Um, that uses the skill sets of the other two parts of the business. He bought Martin from 17-bit. He bought myself from the retail commercial side and Team 17. I think officially um, the company was December the 7th, 1990, but we'd been working on this idea for about a good year before that. See, I never knew that 17-bit was to be one better than 16-bit. So yeah, you, one you, bit you, better than the rest, right? You you did say you'd tell me something I didn't know, and there we go. You already first answer. Um, well, um, Worms is obviously what you're best known for. That arrived, I think, in '94, um, and it was obviously a big bit of a game changer for for Team Seventeen. I mean, that's how it looks from the outside. I mean, how significant really was it? Yeah, I, it, Worms. Um, Worms officially, I think we launched Worms um, November seventeenth. We always have a seven somewhere in key dates without. It happens just by accident um, in 1995, but we signed the game earlier that year. Mm. Um, Andy, who was the creator, um, very similar to the indie scene that everybody's been talking about for the last 10 years. You know, a lot of people think the indie scene is something that's new over the last 10 years. Well, to be honest, it actually existed in the late 80s and early 90s. Bedroom programmers, small teams making games. And Andy... Um, basically entered the game in a competition for, with Future Publishing. I think it was a Amiga format where he entered the game and it didn't win, you know. Um, but he went along to ECTS, which you will probably fondly remember yeah. from our early days in London. Um, Team 17 were an idol of his. Um, I think between 1990 and 1993, to give you an idea, we'd launched over 32 games. Um, we Of the UK, we had over 50% market share of the Amiga market. We'd won joint publisher of the year with Electronic Arts um, at that time. So we were very, very high profile. Um, so we were his heroes. He wanted his game to be handled by Team 17. Um, so he turned up at the show, showed us the game, very similar to what you see at PAX and events like that, where developers come around, sh hand over their game to you and say, will you please check out my game? All that happened back then. Um, and the game was a version of Worms. It wasn't what Worms became, um, but it had that core hook and key element of Worms. And he brought it along. And I always remember it was the Grand National. And I was trying to convince Martin to go and put a bet on at the Grand National because we always put a bet on the Grand National at Team 17. And Andy was there with this game. And it was like we were all playing this game. And I think we missed putting a bet on the Grand National. And that evening when we went back to our hotels, we were all sat playing the game in the evening. Um, and so that's where Worms first came about. But what Andy was, was a typical indie developer. He had a vision. Um, it was his first proper game that he was making and he basically needed a team around him. You know, the game was written in Blitz Basic, so it needed rewriting in C++. But what happened when we launched Worms in November, which coincided predominantly, obviously, we had PlayStation launching for the first time on consoles. Yes. Um, PC wasn't really a big deal back then. It was just starting to become a deal. Um, and I always remember working on the forecast with one of our, pub our publisher at the time, Ocean Software, and we forecast the PlayStation um, sales figures for the first 12 months. And I think we had something like 60,000 units in, right? It went on us on millions, of course. Um, mm. But basically, overnight, um, we'd had hits before. I think the biggest seller that we'd had previous to that was probably Alien Breed at around half a million units. Um, but when Worms landed overnight, multi-millions of units, I mean, it's at 75 million today. And so how did that change Team 17? Completely changed us. Worms obviously defined Team 17 for a long time. Was, yes. that, was that a problem? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we completely forgot what we were once that success happened. You know, when I look back at the previous five years of Team 17 prior to Worms launching, and don't get me wrong, I absolutely do not regret Worms. I think I'm, it's a privilege to be involved in a game that most of us in the industry have grown up playing and is seen as one of those classic games of all time. Um, and that's a huge privilege. But we kind of forgot everything that we were about. You know, um, when I say things like, you know, we helped companies like Epic launch their games over here in Europe in 1991. You know, um, we were do handling games like Super Stardust and working with those guys who are good friends of ours as well. Um, and working with incredible talent, launching a lot of new IP. So how do you, how does a company go from a company that really didn't have sequels apart from Alien Breed, and I think we made one for Project X, to this company that was only working on worms? How did that happen? That came about because you've got massive success and massive pressure, right? Mm. So anybody, you know, from the publishing side, we were self-publishing all of everybody's content up until Worms. Worms was such a big project that we believed was a much bigger commercial opportunity. Um, back then, we had two areas. One was the open platforms, which is the Amiga and the PC market. And then the others were closed platforms, which was the consoles, you know. Um, physical goods, cost of goods. We didn't have the finance for the physical goods. Um, we didn't have the finance to launch a huge marketing campaign. And, and so we chose a partner to go with us and our publisher at the time was Ocean. Um, and that was really a step away from everything that we'd been doing great prior to that in terms of original IP, publishing our own games to all of a sudden massive success. Everybody only ever wanted to talk to us about Worms, whichever publisher we spoke to, it was always when, you know, the next Worms game. Um, and I just think we, we lost our way for quite a long mm. time. But so you work with Ocean. I think you work with quite a few different companies, Virgin, THQ, amongst others. Many. Um, so how how was that experience? Was it all good or a bit of mix? Yeah, I think I looked at between 1995 and I think 2007, 2008, we had 10 different publishers. That tells you everything. We worked with some of the biggest publishers in the world. You know, um, we had, and you know, I don't really want to name names because it's not fair, but I definitely did see the good. We saw the bad and at times we saw the ugly. You know, you um, you don't live with that many publishers and have everything. If we had the perfect publisher, I wouldn't have had 10. We would have had one. Ubisoft, I really enjoy my time working with Ubisoft, really enjoy my time working with Sega. You know, they were good experiences. Um, THQ, um, we had a good time with THQ. But I think what was really fundamental is we had no consistency. And this is where a lot of the inspiration on our label, which we'll come to in a bit, came from. Because we were sat there as a developer. You know, we had, we all, every developer who's been around as long as Team 17 all have horror stories, you know. Um, and we also have great stories. But we, you have to look at what, you need very early on i remember in ios and xbox live arcade I, remember, I, I worked on that game when i was a games tester um uh with worms uh you started publishing yourself again mm -hmm. um you said before this was a major moment in the history of, of team 17 in what way did it change things yeah it was i think we'd been working with um thq on worms open warfare for a few years um and we'd pitched in what was Worms on Xbox Live Arcade, and they'd rejected it, you know, um, and they didn't want to publish that title. They didn't understand the digital world, and it's probably why the old THQ is not around today. The market mm. was moving quite swiftly, um, you know, and we had conversations with Microsoft, and we went first party with Microsoft to bring our products onto that platform. Um, but what that meant was, for the first time in our lives, we were, the the business model was changing. A lot of people don't, you know, I say to indie to developers today, I know a lot is tough, but just flick back a few decades, we were actually, developers were lucky to get royalties ranging between 5% and 30%. You know, the beauty of today, your royalties, you know, they're as high as 70% if you're self-publishing as an indie, right? Um, and so all of a sudden, we were getting the lion's share of the revenue for the content that we created, which allowed us to think more long-term, more sustainable. And 
on the mobile side, you know, um, I also remember our first mobile game, I think it was 2001. It was a game that we did with SK Telecom in South Korea, and that was Worms, um, and it was for Java. And that gave us insight into that world. And then when Open Warfare launched on uh, handheld devices with THQ, we saw the attraction that this was a fun game to play on any device. It didn't matter what the screen size was. Very few, you know, <clears throat> very few games work on all screen sizes, and this was one. Um, Apple obviously approached us, and we made Worms, and we launched that in 2009. I think, you know, I'm hoping I'm correcting my memory. It's, it's semi-good, but not brilliant still. But I do remember that year. I think it was the second best-selling game on iOS with Words with Friends. You know, um, again, significant part of the revenue starting to come into the business and allowing us to look more long-term. Did we choose to go and self-publish on Xbox Live Arcade? No, we didn't. The people we wanted to publish turned us down. We didn't have a choice. It forced our hand. Hindsight's great, great. Thank you very much, THQ, <laughs> for saying no. Well, I guess that and that led you into the world you are in now where you're a publisher of some of the biggest indie games on the market or a games label, as, as you like to go. Mm. So what, you talked about it a few moments ago, but what, what was it that actually inspired you to go down that route and... Yeah, it was a number of things. I think, you know, anybody who's a developer who'd been a developer during the 90s and early 2000s will tell you that they had to battle to get their logos on boxes, on marketing materials. Um, and there always seemed to be a battle over something to do with your studio branding. You know, so that was quite important for me. Um you know, and so I took a lot of influence from the music industry in terms of how they represent artists. You know, you're buying the latest album by your favorite musician. You probably don't even know who their record label is. It's all about putting the artist first and building artist profile. Similar with book authors. You know, you buy books because of the author. You don't buy them because of the book publisher. And so that gave me inspiration. Um I also looked at, you know, I always described Team 17's journey throughout the 90s and 2000s, early, you know, early parts of the 2000s, very much of a roller coaster, lots of highs, but equally some very big lows as well. And a lot of that was because I don't feel that we had the right framework around us, you know, to nurture the talent that we were. <clears throat> and so I felt that developers needed a more stable framework around them. And we could provide that using our knowledge and experience of our lessons, um, but actually have them focused on building sustainability. I think if you ask any independent developer in the world what their dream is, they will tell you it's sustainability. These days, it's very different to what it was even a decade ago. You didn't tend to subcontract out big elements and big parts of the game for other people to make. It was pretty much all done in-house. Indie developers don't have the resources as a startup to actually be able to recruit those people. Even if you've got finance, you might not have the knowledge to ensure that you're getting the right quality of people to partner up with. You know, if you need a bunch of network engineers or you need AI programmers or you want level designers, how do you know that you're getting the right people to fit with the right project? So that influenced me um, basically in the way that film is put together as a film production in outsourcing. So I wanted to bring that into the gaming industry a little bit. And by bringing, the way that I thought about doing it um, was by opening up our internal development resource skills and knowledge, you know. Um, so you're an, in, you know, if you're an indie developer, we can offer you, it's not just publishing, it's not just the other stuff, but we can actually help you create your game. We can help you take that game up another level in terms of polish. And it was that area that really interested me. And it's how we can help developers become sustainable much, much quicker. You talked about uh, as a lot of the games that you release, actually, I think a lot of people realize have been co-developed uh, yeah. by Team 17. I know that the, the second Overcooked game, I know that Ghost Town is sort of part of you guys yes. now, but that was the, the online multiplayer was um, your team, right? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, Ghost Town's still an independent um, developer. Oh, if Ollie and Phil are watching, I need to make that point. They're feisty independent. You know, what happened with Overcooked was very simple. Um, I think they did an interview with you previously and shared I approached them about Overcooked too. And the reason for that was it needed to be network. You know, I'm a big fan in terms of looking forward. Um, my Part of my job and part of my team's job is to look ahead 
and look at what's going off in the market and help our indie partners be prepared for what's coming at those times. Um, Ollie and Phil had worked so hard on Overcooked One. You know, they'd done a few things that I'd asked them to to help me build that franchise. One was when I asked them for additional content just after the game launched so I could take the game into retail. Mm. You know, a lot of people won't understand the importance of retail, but in terms of building a franchise long term, it's important to start that retail shelf presence somewhere. Um, and we needed extra content. So they did that for me and they didn't get a break. Um, then I asked them to make the Nintendo Switch version, which meant that they wouldn't be getting a break either. And they did that. Um, and it really came about when I asked them about the network inside and they have no desires to grow the team beyond, you know, they've got a third member, which is Gemma, which is Phil's wife, who does the writing and does amazing work on the business and on the community side as well with our teams. Um, they have no desire to grow into a big studio. So how do you make the kind of production values that Overcooked 2 needed to be? It needed to be a bit, you know, a step up in terms of the production values, um, investment into the project and team size. We have such a close working relationship. We have a huge amount of trust and faith in each other. You know, I, I think it's probably the biggest testament to what we are as a label when you have somebody handing over their baby and saying, I trust you to help work on this with us. Um, and what they did, they sat in the role of creative directors. You know, Gemma was the writer for the game. And they basically had the lovely joys of signing off our milestones that we delivered to them, you know. <laughs> so we reversed the role completely where publishers sign off milestones to our partners were signing off and working with us on the balancing and the game design and bits like that. But Team 7, our internal studio pretty much built the game for them. Mm. Well, the thing is, I, I always, I don't know if it's done on purpose or by accident, but, you know, Overcooked, The Escapists, Worms, uh, a lot of your games have a certain flavour to them, um, a certain style that, uh, I know some are different as well, not all of mm. them, but what would you say is sort of the quintessential Team 17 game? Uh, I think this is a really tough one because I think a few years ago, somebody told me um, we were quite family orientated, right? Um, our games are played that way. And I was like, we're so not. You know, we're gamers outside of Team 17 games. And trust me, they're not family games that a lot of us play. Um, I think the first thing that we go for, um, Chris, is fun. It has to be a fun experience. You know, visuals, I think today's world is a little bit different. Visuals certainly have to be a much higher standard to a certain degree. Now, production values have risen again. Um, but the first part is it has to be a fun experience. That's number mm. one. Me personally, I'm always attracted by, by vibrant, colorful worlds, right? That always pulls me in. Um, but... I think what we do, quaint essential, you know, fun. I think we, you know, worms, when you think about worms, you go local co-op without a shadow of a doubt, sitting on the couch, playing that. Many people will be listening to this saying, I played that game while I was a student, you know, and I was playing that in dorms with my friends. Other people more recently will have been playing it in lockdown with their family at home. Some will be playing it online. Um, we know what makes great party games and what makes good co-op games, you know, and online experiences in that world. So we people tend to assume that. But I can say to you, honestly, the vision for our label is very simple. Um, we just want to work with great people on great games. We don't really care which genre it is. You know, we're very genre agnostic. I went really out of my way a couple of years ago to make sure that we will bring in a vast array of games onto our label, working with the acquisitions team. You know, and last year, bringing games to market like Hell Let Loose, which is so not a, what you would say is a yeah. Team 17 game. Blasphemous, which is an 18-rated game as well. Um, and that's because I'm always looking at the future. I'm always looking where I want to be as a business for Team 17 in five years or 10 years. And I genuinely, I think all of us as a group at Team 17, we just want to work with the most talented people on the best games possible. And so it's important that we try and be as genre agnostic as we can be. But I hear where you're coming from because people also go moving out. No surprise, Team 17. Yeah. Yeah, I can always spot and golf Team with, 17. Yeah. And golf with your friends, right? Yeah. Yeah. That I can always, you can already spot it. And I've had developers come to me and say, uh, what do you think of our game? They haven't got it signed yet. And I went, you know what? I think that's a Debbie game, that one. I think you'd have to uh, put that in. Well, actually, how many games do you sort of see and compared uh, to how many you sign? 
Okay, we don't make it, any of it public, so I need to go careful what I say um, because oh, okay. of the PLC side. But to give you an idea, we saw a few thousand last year submitted into our label, mm -hmm. right? We signed less than a half a percent. Um, incredibly selective, and that's about, you know, uh, I, I want to help every developer on the planet. If I can help anybody, I you know, I'm, that's my nature. I just want to help make everybody's life a little bit better than what, wherever I can. Um, but the reality is you, we're trying to make, we're trying to help studios become sustainable long-term as independent studios. So it has to be very, it has to be very commercial to a certain degree. Um, and, you know, we're growing quite fast. I think we've doubled our headcount in the last couple of years. You know, mm. we're at about 220, 230 people these days. You know, and it, less than a decade ago, we were 70 people. Um, so it's growing quite quickly. We're building out the, and scaling up the infrastructure. But it's really important um, that we give every partner the right amount of time, the right amount of support to help them. No, it, not just about the game, but it's about helping them build their studios wherever we can. Well, if you're having thousands of games submitted, it must be. What is the current state of the indie games market? How hard is it to sort of be a small creator today? Look, you're always going to find the outlier that's going to come from nowhere and just take the market by storm. Um, you know, but nobody should ever build a business plan, <laughs> presuming that you're going to have one of those outliers, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to take a very realistic approach. And um, for me, realistic is, you know, if I'm advising studios, studios, it's about finding that sweet spot on their break even and profitability. Mm -hmm. You know, game. we all hope for the blue sky results. We all work towards the blue sky results. But this is about people's lives. You know, one thing that I take really serious on our label is it, a lot of people on our label, it's their businesses. They've got kids, they've got mm -hmm. families, they've got mortgages, they've got to buy school shoes for their kids. It's really important that we protect that side for them. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a, I totally advise everybody every single time, please don't borrow money off your family and friends. It's really not advisable. You know, um, don't remortgage your house. It's insane. You know, um, the state of the indie market is quite good. I think it's quite strong. I look at our success rate over the last uh, 18 months in particular. It's been outstanding. Um, I think production values are really important now. I think launching half-baked games that haven't had proper QA or proper lo localization, you know, it's so damaging if you get mixed reviews immediately on Steam. You've really got to focus on that consumer side. Mm -hmm. um, building the community audiences quite difficult you know you've got discord reddit and many other areas um that takes special skill sets to build those yeah. um and and it's direct to gamers these days direct to them you know that's a whole different type of marketing that's not traditional games publishing that's old school that world's kind of all changed about five years ago um so it's how you make sure that you've got that right mix so I think the indie market is quite strong. I think there's been some great titles launched over the last two years. A lot of people will say it's getting harder. I think where it's getting harder is for those games that are just not commercialized, you know, um, at the right levels to support a separate studio or a separate team. Um, and that's why it's so hard. You know, we have a very, very um, busy process within what we call our green light team. You know, they review every game there, you know, it's, it's nonstop all the time. Um, and that's why we have to t make our decisions quite carefully. But yeah, I think it's a good, you, if you've got a great game, a great game's going to do well. You've got to find the right partners to take that to market and help level it, level it up. But also if you've got a really really unique hook. I look back at Worms, it was hardly the most visual game when it launched, right? It no. wasn't, it wasn't that attractive. Um, but the gameplay was fundamental, you know, so it's still, despite how busy it is, how hard it may be to get visibility on stores, you know, if you've got great gameplay, those games tend to find their way. Mm. Oh, good. I'm very conscious of the time and I've got a hell of a question to ask next. Um, oh we're, we're in a time of big disruption. We've got new consoles, new PlayStation, new Xbox. We've got new streaming technology, new business models with things like subscription and Game Pass. What do you think is going to define the future of the games market? I think lockdown has given us a great insight into the future of gaming to a certain degree. You know, um, I don't know what the stats are, but, you know, I've got an 11-year-old son, 
meant he's a, a hard he, he plays he loves video games right i laugh and joke about the fact that this child from the age of five is on countdown to join in the games industry um i look at the way that we've played games in lockdown you know without a shadow of a doubt what you you know whether it's one game running across multiple devices which is very much what we're hearing from some of the platforms cross play for me is absolutely crucial you know this year we're doing it with worms rumble and we're doing it with overcooked as we bring them we are firm believers that people should be able to play against their friends no matter what the device is that's a core part of where we see the long-term future um but online gaming is so so important you know gamers habits have changed in the last six months probably forced mm. to a certain degree um my son you know his social interaction has all been through video games and his little group at the end of each day that he joins um and i actually think you know there is no benefits of covid absolutely zero we'd all turn the clock back and have no benefits um but the one thing that i believe it's done it's it's changed consumer habits quite significantly and it's making us bring forward plans that we where we hope to be in maybe three or four years in terms of the types of games that we make that's probably bringing all that forward now mm, it's accelerated things i think Absolutely. it has that across the world yeah 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 well i'll ask one more question if we can squeeze it in which is a very generic one but um what should we expect from team 17 next Ah, oh, look, you're talking to the people. We are launching six games between now and Christmas, right? Next generation consoles. Our heads are completely focused on that. But I think, truthfully, what's next from us is more of exactly what we have been doing, but bigger and, and more of it. And we are determined to remain the people that we've always been, which is keeping our feet on the ground and making sure that we are educating people and giving back to an industry that's been fabulous for us over three decades. Amazing. Well, thank you, Debbie. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the chatting to us. And thank you all for watching at home. Um, please stay tuned for um, all the other sessions that have coming up. And yeah, have a nice, have, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.